Hey, everybody, how are you? Hello, Raleigh. What a great crowd. Please have a, take a seat if you have one. I once said that at an event, and people didn't have chairs, and the press looked at me and said, what the hell's the matter with that guy? Anyway, Edward, thank you. Sergeant First Class, I was telling him my son, Bo, who I lost because of what happened in Iraq. Anyway, my, my son, Bo, when he made major in Iraq, I was, I was there. I wasn't with him when he made that, when he got promoted. But I was with him later at an event, at an event, at his, anyway, in Iraq. I didn't want to say where I was, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, I said, Bo, congratulations, you're now a field grade officer. He looked at me and said, Dad, I don't know who runs the United States Army. Sergeants first class run it. And that's a fact. So, Sarge, thank you very, very much. Folks, uh, Governor Cooper and all the state officials here today, and by the way, you got the best governor in the country. Where, where, where is he? Roy, stand up. No, I mean it. And you know what I love about him most? I mean this from the bottom of my heart. He has absolute, total integrity. Integrity. <laughs> Thanks for the welcome back to North Carolina, Gov. I appreciate it very much. I also want to mention Congressman De Deborah Ross. Where's Deborah? Did she, I just had my picture taken with her. That's probably why she left. <laughs> no, all kidding aside. Anyway, you, you can, oh, she couldn't be here, actually. That's not true. I got it mixed up. And she has, you know, she fights very hard for the people of this district, and she's up in Washington right now. And, folks, I'm here today to talk about something that doesn't get enough attention, and that's the progress we're making to invest in America, all of America. You know, there was a, there was a law written back in the 30s that says when the Congress passes a bill that has money in it to be spent to build something in America, whether it's an aircraft carrier or, or it's a highway or whatever it happens to be, that the President should use American workers and American products. For the longest, longest time, Democrats and Republican Presidents didn't abide by that very much. But I do, because I want to make sure that we're making it in America, building in America with American products, and that's why we've created 14 million new jobs. <laughs> Folks, Bringing opportunity and hope to people and communities across this country. Let me give you one example of bringing high-speed internet to every person in America. Nearly a century ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Rural Electrification Act, bringing electricity to every home and farm in America because it was in cities, but it wasn't in a lot of rural areas. Because electricity had become an essential part of modern life, so he wanted sure everyone had access to it. He was determined that no American should be left behind, no matter where they lived, whether in a big city or a rural area. Well, I tell you what, I made the same determination about our time, affordable, high-speed Internet. Now, it really is critical. It's just as essential today as electricity was a century ago. Who remembers, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic when schools were shut down, and uh, Master, the Sergeant First Class mentioned it, Kids weren't able to attend school, so they go online. How many of you spent time in McDonald parking lots tapping into their internet so you could do the homework with your kid? Look, think of all the workers who need internet to do their jobs when they're working from home. So many are working from home, have to work. Small businesses need internet to reach more customers here at home and literally around the world. And our seniors are needed in connection with their doctors through telemedicine because they can't make it to the doctors in person. High-speed internet isn't a luxury anymore. It's an absolute necessity. It's an absolute — no, it really is. And yet, when I became president, around 24 million Americans didn't have access to affordable high-speed internet. And for millions more, their internet connection was limited or unreliable. That's why, as soon as I came into office, I took action with what we call the American Rescue Plan. And it included, it included more than $25 billion to invest in affordable internet, high-speed internet all across America. A few months later, I signed a piece of legislation which many people didn't think we could get done, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. 
a once-in-a-generation investment to rebuild America's infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our railroads, our high-speed internet, all of it paid for. And look, our goal is to connect everyone in America to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet by the year 2030, everyone in America. Just like Franklin Roosevelt did a generation ago with electricity. I promise to be a president for all America, whether you voted for me or not. These investments help all Americans in red states and blue states as well. And we're not leaving anybody behind. Look, look around North Carolina and with the leadership of Fiber optic cable is being laid in the ground as we speak. Over the next three years, over 300,000 homes and businesses all across North Carolina will be connected with affordable, high-speed Internet. And today, I'm announcing another major step. We're investing another $82 million to connect 16,000 additional homes and businesses, bringing high-speed Internet all across the state of North Carolina, from top to bottom. By the end of the decade, we're going to finish the job reaching all the remaining homes, schools, libraries, small business, health care facilities in North Carolina that don't have access to high-speed internet today. Let me say that again. Universal high-speed internet in all of North Carolina by the end of this decade. By the end. <laughs> Folks, we just heard from Sergeant Smith a few minutes ago why it matters. He's retired Army, 22 years of service, which we owe him. He and his wife, Emma, live in Tar Heel, as he mentioned. North Carolina population, staggering population, 100 people. <laughs> They've been using dial-up Internet for years, just like everyone else in town. It took Edward far too long to download medical paperwork, as he mentioned the VA. It was hard for his grandkids, who live nearby, to use the Internet to do their homework. And then, thanks to the American Rescue Plan, which I signed in law, fiber optic cable was laid, and the town got high-speed Internet. And now, Edward and Emma and the kids and the grandkids can use the Internet quickly and easily, from getting care from the VA to doing their homework. Look, their neighbors include folks who can't attend local church services, he mentioned. They can stream these services at home every single Sunday. High-speed Internet has been a game-changer for their town and so many counties all across America. Look, and we're just getting started. But it's not enough to just have Internet access. It needs to be affordable. Affordable. So, here's what my administration did. We work with Internet service providers to bring down prices for people struggling with their payments. It's called Affordable Connectivity Program. It's already helped 880,000 households in North Carolina save a total of $440 million in internet bills collectively. That's about one in five families across the state are saving $30 a month for the internet bills, and some save a lot more. That savings in matters in homes like the one I grew up in. Another 30, 40 bucks a month was the difference between how many groceries you pay, the gas bill, all other necessities. It matters. It matters. Plus, the investment we're making in high-speed internet means something else as well. Good paying jobs. And folks, just ask the folks at the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, the IBW, or the Communication Workers Union, or the Laborers Union. Well, we're putting thousands of people to work laying fiber optic cable all across America. And that cable will be made in America, put in by Americans. Even better, a lot of that cable will be made in North Carolina. Two American companies, two American companies, Comscope and Corning, are investing more than $550 million to manufacture fiber optic cable, creating around 650 good-paying jobs in Hickory, North Carolina. A single star. And there are going to be more. Already, 40 percent of all the fiber cable, optic cable in America is being manufactured in Hickory. And no, that number is going to continue to grow. Jobs are going to grow. And when jobs grow, everything grows. Everything grows. Everything in the community grows. All told, during my presidency, we've invested and I know it's going to sound like not much to you all, but 
$11 billion in North Carolina. $11 billion in infrastructure, clean energy, everything from high-speed internet to clean water, new roads and bridges. For example, we're investing $1 billion, $1 billion, in a new rail line connecting Raleigh and Richmond, Virginia. Not only creating a whole hell of a lot of jobs, but it's going to take a lot of vehicles off the road. It's going to help with pollution. And guess what? It's going to cut the time. Well, let me give you an idea. Right now, the trip takes about three hours by train. With the new rail line, it's going to take you two hours. <laughs> Think what that would mean to people traveling to work and visiting families. Think what it means in the reduction of highway bills. We're also investing $110 million to replace the Alligator River Bridge. Look, that bridge is a major hurricane evacuation route for the Outer Banks. So it's high time to get replaced because it's in trouble. The bridge now is far too low for boat traffic, which means cars have to stop and wait, sometimes several times a day, for the bridge to swing open so boats can pass underneath. Because the bridge mechanism is 60 years old, sometimes when it swings open, it can't close, which stops cars in traffic for hours and sometimes days. Now we're building a new higher bridge that boats can easily pass under. It will be wider and more accessible to more cars to travel across every single day, saving time and saving money. Folks, what we're doing here in North Carolina is just one piece of a much bigger story. To date, 400, excuse me, 40,000 infrastructure projects have been announced across this nation. Since I've been to office, we've created 14 million new jobs. 440 new jobs in North Carolina alone just since I came back. That's because of this guy right here. Nearly 800,000 manufacturing jobs nationwide. Unemployment has been below 4 percent for the longest stretch in American history in the last 50 years. And here in North Carolina, unemployment is even lower. It's 3.5 percent. And the stats coming out today show that seeking unemployment insurance has even gone down. Fewer people are needing the help. That's lower than it was in every single month under the last president. Wages are up. Household wealth is up, not only for middle-class Americans, for Latinos, for black Americans, for minorities. Costs are still too high, but inflation continues to fall, and mortgage rates are falling, and they're going to fall more. Last week, we learned that America filed 16 million, 16 million in America, 16 million new applications for businesses, for a new business since I became president. Folks, that's a record. Every single one of those new small businesses is an act of hope, an act of hope. It generates progress. People are beginning to have, and if you look at the consumer confidence, it's way up. 64 percent, I think, maybe 62 percent. Americans think their personal circumstance is good and it's getting better. Meanwhile, thanks to the Invest in America agenda, private companies have invested over $640 billion — let me say it again — $640 billion in advanced manufacturing here in America. And by the way, you know, we invented that little computer chip which everything from your cell phone to your automobile needs. Guess what? We used to control it. We got down to the part we hardly manufactured any of it. And so what happened when things went bad, we didn't have access to all those computer chips that were being made in Asia and other parts of the world. So I got in the plane and went to South Korea. And I said, why don't you come invest in America? One thing led to another. You know, over $50 billion, people coming to America, investing and building these computer chip factories. And guess what? It's just getting started. But guess what? The fact is that these computer factories, they build what they call fabs. They're about as big as a football field, and they manufacture these chips. You don't need a college degree to work in it. You know what the average starting salary is? $116,000. $116,000. And look, put it all together. America has, this is a fact, the strongest growth rate 
of any and the lowest inflation rate of any major economy in the world, in the world. We have a lot more work to do. There's no question our plan of investing in America and the American people is working. It's all part of my economic vision, building an economy from the middle out, from the middle class out, and the bottom up. That way, the poor have a shot, middle class does well, and wealthy still do well. Well, they got to start paying their taxes. Yeah. You know, I'm serious. I, I don't mean paying 60 percent. I mean just paying the top rate of 38 percent. Look, folks, you know how many billionaires we have in America today? 1,000. You know what their average rate, tax rate, federal tax rate is? I oh, see walk away from this. <laughs> federal tax rate is 8.5 percent. Raise your hand if you'd trade your tax rate for 8.5 percent. <laughs> I mean, serious, think about this. There'd be $40 billion raised if they just paid 38 percent, if they even paid 25 yeah. percent. Folks, look, we all do well when the middle class does well and we grow. Everybody does well. You know, I'm so tired I, of trickle-down economics. I grew up in a family where not a lot trickled down on my dad's kitchen table. My dad was a hardworking guy. We weren't poor, but we lived in a three-bedroom split-level home with four kids and a grandpa. And, you know, we were fine. It was okay. But there wasn't anything left over. There was nothing left over. But now, a lot of middle-class folks are having enough leftovers. They can do things. Our approach is the fundamental break from trickle-down economics, supercharged by my predecessor. My predecessor, everything was trickled down, but not a lot trickled. <laughs> and I'm serious. Which tax cuts for the wealthy and big corporations shipping goods overseas. How many people do you know in this state and other states? There was a factory in town that employed 300, 400 people. And all of a sudden, you found that factory shipped overseas. Why was it shipped overseas? Cheaper labor costs. So we were shipping factories overseas and importing the product they made here. Well, guess what? We're doing the opposite. We're making it here and shipping the product overseas. I'm serious. And also, that trickle-down shrank public investment in education, infrastructure and education. It hollowed out communities, closing factories, leaving too many behind. And now, my predecessors like to say, America is a failing nation. In my faith, bless me, Father, for his sin. I mean, come on. <laughs> a failing nation. And by the way, did you hear he wants to see the stock market crash? Because he does not want now. We're doing well. He acknowledges by that we're doing pretty damn well economically and getting better. He wants to see the stock market crash. You know why? He doesn't want to be the next Herbert Hoover. As I told him, he's already Hoover. <laughs> he's the only president to be president for four years and lose jobs, not gain any jobs. Come on, man. You know, some of the things he said — well, I don't get started. <laughs> but look. Frankly, to put it very politely, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Meanwhile, the vast majority of Republicans in Congress voted against our infrastructure law. We got enough to make it work of 30 some, but the vast majority voted against it. They all voted against all the other bills that I have. I mean, 100 percent voted against. And guess what? Whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene or whoever, now when these new projects come, they're, 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 they're welcoming them to their state. They voted against it all. So I told him I'll be there for the groundbreaking with him. You know, <laughs> look, what was mentioned as well, look what we — I fought my whole career. I've been around — I know I don't look it, but I've been around for a little while. <laughs> but all kidding aside, look, uh, you know, I spent a bulk of my career as a senator trying to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. If you have a prescription from your doc, and you take it to a pharmacy here in North Carolina or Wilmington, Delaware, where I'm from, or wherever, guess what? I can take that same prescription from you and go to Toronto, Canada, London, England, Rome, and Italy, anywhere around the world, and it'll be somewhere between 50 percent less and 70 percent less. How does that work? Why? 
Why is it in America you're paying, or we're paying $400 a month for insulin if you have diabetes? And, and, and other places are paying 35 bucks. Well, guess what? You're paying 35 bucks now, and it's going to go down even further. And by the way, at $35, they're making 350% gain. It costs 15, it costs 10 bucks to make it, 12 bucks. What I haven't done is I haven't blocked projects in their districts because they're all Americans. The fact they have a, a senator or a congressman doesn't know what they're doing doesn't mean they should be denied. But it's okay. It's okay because I promised to be a president for all Americans. And I mean that sincerely. It's not hyperbole. I promise to be a president for all Americans. Like I said before, I told them all, I'll see them at the groundbreaking. But let me close with this. When you see shovels in the ground, cranes in the sky, and people hard at work in these projects, I hope you feel pride in America. Pride in America. Pride knowing we can get big things done when we work together. You're all the real heroes. It's not hyperbole. You're the real heroes in this story. American workers. The American people, neighbors and community leaders doing the work to bring our cities into the future. That's what America does. That's why I've never been, and I mean this, and I've been saying this for a while, and the press has to, the press has to cover me everywhere. I've been saying I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. I've, I've been around for a while. I've never been more optimistic about America's prospects than I am in the last three years. I really mean it, because there's nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America. And nothing is beyond our capacity when we work together. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And I'll say one last thing. We're the only major company in the world that's come out of every crisis stronger than we went in. And that's what we're doing again today because of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Thank you very much. Let's go get them. Thank you.